Thank you, Nada. Thank you, Rida. Uh, so hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for dialing in for our webinar today. My name is Jan Mawad, and I'm the head of the Management and Entrepreneurship Program at Isaac Business School. Our webinar today falls under the Global Entrepreneurship Week and is organized in collaboration with the Babson Collaborative for Entrepreneurship Education and the Asher Center for Entre Entrepreneurship and Innovation, the ACIE. At UBS, we strive to nurture the entrepreneurship mindset in our small community, the students, and our larger community, the Lebanese business families included, and to support managers, business owners, and entrepreneurs like you to face the challenges uh, within their respective fields. During this afternoon, we'll be discussing the best practices of family business governance, and we'll be sharing expertise on how successful family businesses manage conflict, featuring insights shared by uh, Dr. Matthew Allen from Babson College, USA, and Dr. Ashraf Shita from the American University of Cairo, Egypt. Uh, you can expect each speaker to have the floor for about 20 minutes, and uh, you will get the chance to participate uh, in the Q&A session. Kindly feel free to post your questions in the chat throughout the webinar, uh, and we'll address them during the Q&A. By the end of our time today, we hope you feel more comfortable and confident about family business governance and conflict management. We're very passionate about this topic and have many exciting stories and learnings to share here today. We'll start with Dr. Nada Sarkis, the Associate Dean of the Business Faculty at ISAC, with the welcome note. Nada. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you, John. you so much. Good afternoon. On behalf of Dr. Daniel Khalife, Dean of the ISAC Business School, I would like to welcome everyone to what promises to be a great webinar on the subject of governance and conflict management in family businesses. Allow me first to extend our heartfelt thanks to our guest speakers and our partners, ACIE and Babson Collaborative, for their time and effort in bringing together this event. Many things of family businesses as old-fashioned companies, passed down from one generation to the next. The reality is they account for a majority of global companies, provide 70% of the global GDP, and 60% of the global employment. Most of them develop from startups to become key drivers of global business and growth. However, long-term success of family firms is not given, and it is surely not an easy task to succeed across multiple generations. So here comes the importance of this webinar. As family business increases in age and wealth, many complexities arise when ownership, management, and family roles tend to overlap with less clear distinction between them and with the multiple conflicting agendas. There are several threats that can pose a risk to their continuity and thus ensuring their survival become a delicate affair. Without a vital corporate and family governance system in place, dispute in the family can potentially spill into the business and vice versa, causing long-term impact on business sustainability and family harmony. Managing conflict is key not only to the endurance of the business, but also for the survival of the family. Being siblings or cousins may not be enough at times. So it is crucial for these members to establish strong and well-structured business relationships. So let us listen to our distinguished guests shedding light on key lessons that would help sustain family businesses. Without further ado, I will give back the microphone to my colleague, Jean, to moderate this exciting talk wishing you all a very fruitful session. Thank you, Dr. Nada. Let yes. me first introduce our first speaker for this afternoon. Uh, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Matthew Allen. Dr. Allen is an associate professor in the entrepreneurship division and faculty director of the Family Entrepreneurship Amplifier Program and Family Learning at Babson College. Coming from a family business himself, uh, the issues family businesses face are personal and relevant to him. Dr. Allen is also active as a consultant to family businesses around the world. Dr. Matt, we are eager and ready to listen to you. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I am so happy to be with you this afternoon. 
I'm I'm joining this webinar from the Boston area, so it's about 8.30 in the morning, and what a great way to start the morning, to be able to talk about family businesses. I was thrilled to hear the introduction of the topic, and I know we hear it quite often, especially for those of you that are part of family businesses, this idea that 70% of GDP and 60% of employment across the globe comes from family businesses. But sometimes I think we don't recognize what that truly means. I teach in a business school and I am often surprised that the topic of family business is almost a secondary topic, right? We talk a lot about these publicly traded corporations. We talk about startups. We talk about venture capital funding. And sometimes I think we forget 60% is well over a majority of GDP and employment, 70%, those are big numbers. I wonder sometimes why we don't have family business as the primary topic and then these other topics as a secondary topic. But today I wanna to talk a little bit about these concepts of governance and conflict management, but I'm gonna take it from a Babson perspective. So for those that are familiar with Babson, Babson's claim to fame is entrepreneurship. And as a small college, that is our number one primary focus. And so I'm going to approach this topic of governance and conflict management from an entrepreneurship perspective. And I don't know if that's a common perspective, but I hope by the time I get done, you'll have a different view that you can look at how entrepreneurship intertwines with governance and how entrepreneurship intertwines with conflict and conflict management. So first I just wanna ask a question, and this is for you to answer yourself. We did a, a study with the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, which is hosted out of Babson College. It's a entrepreneurship study that includes, I think well over 50 different economies. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of responses. And the purpose of this Global Entrepreneurship entrepreneurship monitor is to understand entrepreneurship country by country. So what this study has done over many years is, is really help us to understand what does entrepreneurship look like in different economies in different countries. But a few years ago, they gave us the opportunity to add a few questions about family business to this global study. And we were thrilled, you can imagine, right? We're going we're gonna to get hundreds of thousands of responses from entrepreneurs about family. And so we were allowed to add, I think, three questions to this survey. And we asked some questions about family and startups. So I, I'm going to give you a context, and then I want you to think about this question. So this survey is going to entrepreneurs. This is not to family businesses. So these are, these are owners of businesses or entrepreneurs that are starting businesses. And we're talking about businesses that are either starting up or less than five years old. So these are all young businesses. I don't think any of these businesses could be considered family businesses yet. But the question that was asked was in these businesses, how many of these businesses had either if other family members involved in management or other family members involved in ownership? So ownership or management or a combination of both. So the question I want to ask is what percent of startups Again, not family businesses, what percent of startups in the world, so this is across 50-something economies, what percent of startups involve more than one family member, meaning there's more than one family member in management or more than one family member in ownership, which to me would say future family business. So what do you think? I mean, if you think about 60% of employment, 70% of GDP, Clearly, family businesses play a big role, but does that role extend to the startup world? So the answer, and I'm just going to share my screen really quickly here, was really surprising to me. The answer was that 75%, so 75% of all startups across the world either had more than one family member in ownership or more than one family member in management. To me, that is astounding. Coming from a school that teaches entrepreneurship, that's even more astounding because just like what I talked about, when we talk about entrepreneurship, just like talking about business, we usually talk about entrepreneurs as lone individuals. We talk about venture capital or private equity funding. We talk about entrepreneurial teams, but we don't talk a lot about family. 
And what this tells me is if we're talking about entrepreneurship, we are talking about family. 75%, that's three quarters of all startups that are family involved. And I think it explains why and how we get to this situation where 70% of GDP across the globe is, is understood through family businesses. So let me tell you why this matters. What, what, what does this mean to us when we're talking about conflict? And what does this mean to us when we're talking about governance? I think what it means is that families are incubators for entrepreneurship. I think families naturally are problem solvers. And so when we think about governance and when we think about conflict, we need to think about entrepreneurship because families play that role. And let me tell you why and how this works. I'm going to talk first about conflict management, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about governance. So let's, let's talk about conflict management first. I taught a class. So when I came to Babson, I've been at Babson for about 10 years. And when I came to Babson, they brought me to Babson to teach family businesses. And so I was so excited. I'm going to come in. I'm going to teach family businesses. I grew up in a family business. This just makes sense to me. And because of our focus on entrepreneurship, I said, okay, I'm going to teach a family entrepreneurship course. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite only students that come from family businesses to come to my course. And I'm going to, I'm going to force them to do something entrepreneurial with their family. And I thought it was a brilliant idea. And I was so excited. So I got these students in the class. I think I had 30 in my first semester. And I said, all right, the, the project for the class is you're going to do an entrepreneurial project with your family. And I'm going to teach you how to be entrepreneurs. And so throughout the semester, they worked with their family. They developed ideas. They did elevator pitches. They did reports. All through the semester, I was watching these projects as they developed. And I was really excited because some of these projects were really interesting. And they were working with their families. And I just thought, this is it. We're developing entrepreneurs. And so at the end of the semester, I asked them to do a presentation. And in that presentation, they would present their entrepreneurial idea, and then they would talk about what they learned. And so, as you can imagine, as a professor, I was excited to hear about the ideas, and I was more excited to hear them talk about everything they learned about entrepreneurship. So the first student stands up and they say, this is my idea, and they talk about what they did, and then they went into what they learned. And instead of doing what I expected, which was to talk about entrepreneurship and how excited they were to be better entrepreneurs, guess what they said? They said, let me tell you what I learned. I learned a little bit more about my mother and I learned about my uncle and I learned why my father is so stubborn. And I, I learned why for my family, it's so important that we are educated. And all of these things over and over again about the family, nothing about entrepreneurship. I thought, okay, that was anomaly. Next student. And the next student comes up and the exact same thing. They talked about their project and then they talked about their family. And I could not understand it. I was, I was expecting this big focus on entrepreneurship. And what I got was a big focus on family. And so I taught the course again the next year. And the same thing happened. And the third year. And the same thing happened. And I'm a little bit slow to understand things, but eventually I realized this entrepreneurship class wasn't about entrepreneurship. This was a class about family. This was a class about how families function and how family members get along with each other and how entrepreneurship can be a tool for helping families to avoid or to deal with conflict. And so I changed my course. And for the past seven years, I have been teaching a course that we call the Family Entrepreneurship Amplifier. And what we do in that course is we use entrepreneurship to help families to deal with conflict, to help families to learn to work together more effectively. And I wanna talk a little bit about how and why that works. So number one, why does that work? Well, number one, I already said, 75% of startups are family. Families are an incubator for entrepreneurship. Families are naturally inclined to problem solving. But what happens when a family starts a business and that business becomes established? Obviously, in the first generation, you've got a lot of entrepreneurship, you've got a lot of problem solving, we're trying new things, we're innovating. And then you get to the second generation and the business starts to grow. And now we're bringing money into the family, there's wealth that's being created, 
And what happens with that family? That family starts to be a little bit more careful, don't they? They start to look at the business as an asset and they want to protect that asset. So we start to put controls in place so that we can protect that asset. And by by the time a family gets to the third generation, maybe that business has grown even more and we have cousins involved in the business. And now we really want to protect that business. And so the family, what happens is the family gets pushed aside and the business becomes the primary focus. And because we're protecting this important asset, innovation and entrepreneurship decline. We don't want to ruin the business. So don't talk to me about innovating. Don't talk to me about entrepreneurship unless it's related to growing the business. But if we do it, we're going to do it very, very carefully. And so entrepreneurship becomes an output. I want you to think about the input, throughput, output process, right? So when we talk about business, we're talking about we have these inputs, these inputs go in, we do something with these inputs, and then we get this output, which is a product. Well, entrepreneurship is often thought of as an output, right? What, what do we do? Well, we want to we want to give autonomy to the family. We want to give motivation to the family. We want to do whatever it is we can to promote entrepreneurship. And then the output is entrepreneurship, meaning new business ideas, new development, growth, or whatever the case might be. Well, what I discovered in my teaching is that entrepreneurship actually functions on both ends of that input, throughput, output. Entrepreneurship can also be an input to the process. We can use entrepreneurship as a tool to develop the family and to help the family to get along with each other. Because what happens when we do that? What happens when we bring entrepreneurship as an input is that because entrepreneurship is focused on problem solving, suddenly we can use entrepreneurship to involve the whole family and to bring in the younger generation and to start to develop the younger generation, to help the younger generation to, to grow and to share their ideas. That happens within entrepreneurship. It doesn't happen as well within the family business because we're so protective. So we pull the family out of the family business, focus on new ideas, focus on innovation, allowing the entire family to grow and the entire family to be involved and the entire family to engage. Let me show you a picture that I think is really demonstrative of what happens here. So this is a little bit of a silly picture. If you're looking at it, you, you might wonder what on earth is going on. This is what I call the marshmallow challenge. And in the marshmallow challenge, I do this in some of my entrepreneurship classes, and it, it's a way to get teams interacting together, and it's a way to innovate. And with the marshmallow challenge, you can do it in lots of different ways. But in this particular challenge, I gave the students a box of spaghetti. So these are dried spaghetti noodles and a bag of marshmallows. And the goal was to build a tower as tall as they could using those tools. And I do it in class and it's kind of fun because they're competitive and then you measure the towers. But these particular pictures were not from students. These were from families. So I was doing a webinar, uh, a week long seminar with families online during COVID and we were talking about innovation and entrepreneurship. And I challenged them to get their entire family together and to do the marshmallow challenge as a family. So I want you to imagine this, right? These are 60 year old CEOs that are gathering their family together and saying, hey, we're going to do a marshmallow challenge as a family. It was amazing. What happened with these families is that these 60 and 70 year old CEOs suddenly got taken over by their 16 and 17 and sometimes even 10 and nine year old grandchildren as they built these towers. And they started to feel what does it feel like as a family to work together to solve a problem. They were reminded of the entrepreneurial capability that families have, this innate ability that families have to solve problems and to be entrepreneurial. And because it had nothing to do with the business, suddenly the CEO became almost irrelevant in the process. They were watching as the rest of the family came together and worked as a team to solve these problems. And some of the towers weren't that great. On the left, you can see this shorter tower. It wasn't particularly tall, but look at this one on the right, this pyramid. To me, this is fantastic. And I guarantee you, this was not the result of business management team building. This was the result of the whole family coming together and solving a problem together. So 
my my message to you today about conflict management is look to entrepreneurship as a way to resolve conflict and as a way to build communication skills within your family. If your family is struggling with conflict, then get together and solve a problem together. Step away from the family business, pick a problem either in the community or in the business world or in the market, and as a family, come together and solve that problem together. Be entrepreneurial, come up with ideas. And what you're going to see is the conflict eroding as the family learns to work together. And you're also going to see the capability of the family to solve problems more effectively increasing. That's the power of entrepreneurship in this conflict management. The second piece, and I've only got about four more minutes, so I don't want to take a lot of time, but I want to talk about governance. And I want to talk about governance as it relates to entrepreneurship and governance as it relates to conflict. What we see in the consulting world in a lot of places is a push towards governance. They come into families and they say, you know, you need more governance. You need structure. You need a board. You need a family council. You need um, a family protocol. You need to put all of this in place for the family to survive. And I am not disagreeing with that, but I am disagreeing with the tone of the message. Because if we're not careful, what we hear in that message from the consultants is we need to remove the family from the process. The family is the problem, and we're going to use governance to help push the family out. Let's make sure that the family is not directly involved in decision making, and let's make sure that emotion doesn't play a role in how we decide what comes next. And let's make sure that the family is controlled or that we put the family in a box so they, they don't inhibit the growth of the business. I don't think that's the intended message, but I think that's the message that many families often hear. My message about governance is we need to be careful because that business was not created to serve the business. That business was created to serve the family. And it was actually started by the family. Good governance integrates effectively the family and the business together. Ownership, management, family need to be integrated together. And in a similar way, entrepreneurship plays a key role in building good governance. I will often have families come to me and they'll say, Professor Allen, we need a family protocol. Can you create a family protocol for us? And, and I say, well, I could, but I won't. And they always look at me like, well, why? We're going to pay you. Can't you create a family protocol for us? And I say, no, you're, you're misunderstanding how governance works. A family protocol is an important tool that a family can use. But in my mind, in my opinion, the reason that it's an important tool is because it's something that gets created by the family and for the family. So if I come into a family and I give them a family protocol based on other protocols that I've seen, there's no value in that protocol. The value comes when the family gets together as a group and they spend months, sometimes even years, in order to develop a protocol for themselves. And then the protocol becomes the fruits of that entrepreneurial effort, the effort of the family getting together to solve problems. The value of that protocol isn't the written document. The value of that protocol is the effort that went into creating that document, the arguments and the discussions, the conflict and the problems as the family sat around the table in order to create a family protocol. A couple of years ago, I worked with a family for three years to update their family protocol. Can you imagine that? Three years to update their family protocol. But in the room during this discussion, there were 45 people, 45 family members that were adults that were trying to get their head around what it is this family needed. And it was a beautiful process. There were fights and there were squabbles. There were disagreements. There was even yelling from time to time. That wasn't the best part. But the best part was that through this process, they got to know each other. They used entrepreneurial thinking and entrepreneurial mindsets to come up with solutions to problems that were raised by different branches of the family and different needs that the family had. And in the end, they created this document that they call the family protocol that was transformative for the family. And it was not transformative because of what was written in that document. 
it was transformative because of what happened to arrive at what was written in that document. And so again, my message to you, use entrepreneurship as an input. The creation of governance should be an entrepreneurial process. And it can bring the family together and it can build capability and it can actually lower conflict. Just like entrepreneurship as an input to the family process can build capability in communication, can build capability around working together and can reduce conflict. So my message in short, entrepreneurship matters, but entrepreneurship matters in helping the family to work together. And I look forward to questions at the, at the end of the seminar. So thank you so much for being here and allowing me to be part of this. Thank you very much, Dr. Matt. Thank you. Uh, our second speaker for this afternoon, uh, Dr. Ashraf Shita. Dr. Shita is the founder and CEO of Ashraf Shita for consultancy and training uh, company. He works as an adjunct assistant professor for entrepreneurship and family business at the American University of Cairo. His academic and non-academic work is diversified, mainly in entrepreneurship, small business development, strategic planning, innovation, and family business. Dr. Shita, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Jean. And thank you, Matt, for the informative session. I think it's very difficult for me to come after you because you have already covered a lot of things. So I will adopt a different approach. I want to give you a story. Actually, it is my story. And I want to draw some reflections upon that. I originally come from an engineering background, civil engineering, actually. And we had our family business in textiles. So I guess this might be relevant to some people around who are uh, at this session. The problem started maybe years and years ago. I started with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and I joined the family business by default and take care. It was not a choice, which is a thing that a lot of people around here in our region might be suffering. It was not a choice. It was something obligatory. Another thing that I want to highlight that we were two children, me and my daughter. She passed away maybe uh, three months ago. And uh, uh, my, sorry, my, my sister, she passed away uh, two or three months ago and she never saw the business. And I will highlight that later because it's a cultural issue. I started working as a mechanical engineer, which was not my occupation sweeping the floors, working as a mechanic. And the story goes on and on and on. And I guess a lot of people here within this session has already passed through that. And of course, during that time, my late beloved father, we had a lot, a lot of conflicts. I did not know anything about the business, just an engineer. We have no uh, knowledge whatsoever about the uh, the science of family business and so on and so forth. Never imagined to be a professor at the, at the university, but this came along afterwards. Uh, the problem was there was a lot of conflict between the founder and the second generation, which was me. And also there was no governance because we did not know anything about anything called governance. And we did not know anything about having some ways of conflict resolution. So the chance came years and years afterwards. I worked as a professor at the American University in Cairo, and I was in charge of developing the entrepreneurship concentration. So we started as usual with the introduction to entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship and innovation, very, very, uh, useful and very interesting subjects. And then we draw attention that there is something called family business. Why don't we go into this type of topic? And this drew to me some attention that there is a science called family business. It's not just by coincidence. And it brought along all of the sufferings that I have suffered throughout of my life. 
So it was some sort of a passion. It was some sort of a personal mission. What drew attention to me also is that around 70% of the students at my university are coming from family businesses. So this might be an opportunity. And we started the first family business course in spring 2017. And it was really funny that I wanted to design the course in a highly practical manner. I claim that I'm an academic professor and that's the, this is very nice, but the approach must be practical. So the outcome of the, of the, the course and the, all of the courses that I'm teaching was usually a case study. Case study, it's co-written with the uh, students. And this made the course very interesting. And the case study was always about their businesses, their family businesses. So we are trying to resolve problems regarding conflict or conflicts in the family business, also governance within the family businesses. And at the beginning, they did not know anything about family business governance and such big words like governance, how kama in, in Arabic, we call it how kama in Arabic, and conflict management, succession. And I was always asking myself, why was I chosen as a successor, not my sister? It's just because I'm the eldest son and I am the male in the family. And this drew my attention back. Why, why, why was it Ashraf, not Dina, my beloved sister? This also another issue. And I started reading also about employment policy. We did not have an employment policy. And I started reading about governance. We did not have a governance uh, within the family business. And I started reading about uh, uh, also ownership agreements, which is something very, very interesting. Some of you might be in the third generation or the second generation. Should be there some sort of an ownership agreement? Should we sell to each other? Should we have someone from outside of the family to be part of the family business? Other issues. What about the strategy? What about moving from a family business to a business family, highly entrepreneurial business so that can sustain for around 100, 150, whatever. These are all things that should be taken into consideration. What about the strategies of the family business? Can it change along the way? For example, what's going on nowadays uh, globally related to Russian-Ukrainian war and so on and so forth, COVID-19. What about innovation in the family business? What about culture in the family business? What about emotional intelligence, which I, was a main problem for someone like me? I did not have any emotional intelligence. No empathy whatsoever towards the founder. So I talked to him like, uh, you know, like uh, face to face, tete a tete. I was always clashing and I believe that I was right. I was always right, which proved to be later on that I was not right. He had a point of view. I never point, I never put myself in his shoes. He is the one who, is, who has already founded. So these are the things we, we needed to, to understand. And we found out through the years, that there are a lot of subcultures. Not in Egypt, we have Upper Egypt, we have the Delta, we have the Nile, we have the Eastern of Egypt. Each one of them has a different culture. And I guess the same applies for Lebanon. The North is different from the South and the beliefs and norms are, and the traditions might be different. One of the other things that attracted my attention that, okay, I'm teaching you about governance and so on and so forth. And there was always a problem. Okay, my father, we will go on and we want to establish a family protocol or an ownership agreement or some sort of whatsoever succession plan. And the usual thing that we face that the founder, okay, you want to inherit me while I'm alive? You want to talk to me about ownership agreement while I'm alive? A lot 
of things, practical things that made things to be, uh, it was really nice to be theoretical, but when you go into implementation, it's very hard. And I face these problems or these, these questions with my students a lot. And, and it happens as well, working as a consultant. How am I going to approach my father? How am I going to approach the founder? Other issues, very interesting issues. Things related to job description. Myself and maybe some of you, I never had a job description. Okay. And this is something that might not be related to people in the West. I'm just a member of the family. And by default, I entered the business. Okay. Am I right? Do I have a job description? Automatically, I will be in the leadership position. Why? I don't know. Do I know enough about the business? I don't know. And automatically, you will be the successor. And this is something that needs to be uh, mentioned. That this is, there is something within the family business science. I might not be the suitable successor. We should have a job description to avoid any conflicts. Other things that were attracted my attention, that there was always a role for the spouses within the family business, especially at our region. There was always complexity related to how will the spouses act, especially if you are in the third or the second generation, branches, cousins, and sisters. Uh, I wanna tell you something that happened to me uh, when it, with one of our published cases. Uh, there was always, uh, in this case, there was some sort of animosity between the spouse of the founder and the uncle. Very interesting, how can you resolve this? Unfortunately, the founder passed away and the spouse was in charge of three daughters. And the uncle was supposed to inherit, according to the Sharia, okay, some of the business, although he was not the founder. So what to do? A problem that needed to be resolved. Another issue that was very interesting, in a case study that we wrote together, the family was coming from Upper Egypt. We call it Al Said, which is really conservative. And uh, in this part, some of the families say that the daughters should not inherit within the business. I can give the daughters something outside of the business, some, something from their family wealth, maybe real estate or whatever. Another issue that the daughters or the family will never involve someone from outside of the family with the name, for example, Sheta in Alan's family business. The reason is he is not our family. He is the spouse of our daughter or whatever, but he's not family. So we will not let him come into the family. These are all issues. And it is really practical and we face it a lot. One of the issues that I'm facing right now as a consultant, uh, I, I am a consultant and advisor for a family where the father have only three daughters, three daughters, but he is involved in other companies with his brothers. So he is a little bit shy to open the subject that guys, I'm afraid what will happen afterwards if I pass away, what will happen to my daughters? So we are trying to have some sort of a balanced solution where he and his daughters will be represented over the board of the other companies. And on the other hand, keep their companies for their own. These are all cultural issues. What happened is that afterwards, we produced around 40 published case studies, two of them got, or three of them got awards. In fact, I published a case about my business and what happened in my business, okay? And why was my sister not involved? I don't know, up till now. Because she was a girl or a female 
these are practical issues. One of the other, other issues is that there is a mix in our region, I can claim in our region, not only in Egypt, that there is no separation of ownership from management. We take them as a bundle. I am an owner, so automatically I will be in charge of the management. Why? Why? There is a problem in that. There is also a problem related to professionalism. The idea is that in our society or in Egypt, I can claim, there is some sort of a cynical uh, saying, this is a family business. This is a family business. Guys, we know from research that as family business, our performance might be much more better than other businesses related to expansion and growth and so on. And this is proved by research. So again, should I have a glass ceiling for the people who are working with me? Should I have some sort of a business philosophy uh, that we are adopting? I saw some, some cases in Egypt, big businesses right now, that they have started developing or developed their own family protocol or family constitution, which is really important. And I'm not saying I agree with Alan that sometimes you do not need a protocol. But in our society, you have at least to have an ownership agreement, an agreement between family members, at least be, uh, because we are going into a third and fourth generation, what will happen? Things, we will have conflicts. If you don't have anything written, and I believe in the saying, what is not written does not exist. Eventually, eventually in our society, we will suffer. Conflicts and conflicts and conflicts, never to be resolved. I'm talking about practical things that I am facing. And one, one of the th things that I have faced is the succession planning. Who is going to be the su successor? Is it going to be the young, uh, the, the girl, the oldest? Usually in our society in Egypt, it is the eldest a son, not the daughter. And this needs to be resolved. But I have seen a case, and uh, it's written, we, uh, we have a published case about that in Egypt, a case where they brought a consulting agency and they made some sort of what we call psychometric analysis. M maybe we can talk about this later on. And they chose the daughter, which in, in, in sequence, she was the second uh, the second of the children. So they chose the, the second and she was a female and she's leading, it's a whole group, it's a big group in publishing. She's leading the, the family business fantastically because she had some sort of, uh, uh, of uh, qualities that was not there. Another issue that big families Big families are starting nowadays in Egypt, and I have a lot of uh, uh, clients. Big families are starting to notice that you, you need to put the family and to separate uh, the management from ownership. You need to have some sort of institutionalization for the family business. You need to institutionalize the family business so that it moves to being a business family, not a family business entrepreneurial family and so on. I don't know, Jean, where, where, whether I'm exceeding my time or not. How much time do we have? Uh, a minute. A minute. So <laughs> to cut it short, I have uh, a message. Please always try to separate ownership from management, number one. Number two, it is not necessarily to keep everything within the family. Try to think that this is a business. It is not only a family business, of course, but try to take it as a business. This business might last for 100 years. You might try to keep ownership or ownership, but try to keep it within the boundaries of institutionalization. Please don't differentiate between females and males. Please don't think that females should not go into that type of 
business, maybe queries, which is very tough. Textile is very tough. Believe me, females sometimes can really give a better performance, far much more better performance. Just give them the chance. I finished. Thank you, Jean. Less than Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Very relatable uh, life story and business uh, story. We have some comments that um, came uh, through the uh, chat. And um, really, we have uh, some participants that are sharing, I'm quoting, the same pain uh, you did, Dr. Ashraf. And uh, talking from my own um, uh, experience also, uh, we, sh we all share the same experience. So Dr. Ashraf, a question to you regarding the difficult conversations regarding the succession. If the first generation or second generation is not willing to um, start talking about this, what are the first steps that they should do? To be honest, yeah. uh, and I always say, number one, I do not own the absolute truth. Number two, it's a case by a case. So in family business, we do not have a theory for family business. It's a case by a case. Number three, I, I would recommend that you learn a lot about emotional intelligence. There is always an entrance point for Ashraf or for Matt or for Jean. Just try to learn. Just be empathic. Just be sensitive. Sometimes you might need to put a catalyst or an intermediary. Usually this intermediary can be your mother or someone very close, or a very close friend. Sometimes I use this tactic in my classes. Whenever there is a resistance, I tell them, why don't we invite your father or the founder to the class and watch what will happen? This is very interesting and it proved out to be right. So. Uh, the insight or the demand might not be coming directly from you. It might be coming from the professor at the class or the consultant. Just try to get away. Maybe he or she will, uh, will listen because it's a very sensitive matter. I'm trying to answer briefly. Thank you. Dr. Matt, please, can you, uh, do you have any uh, thing to add regarding this matter? No, I would agree completely. I think when when the conversations don't happen bringing somebody in from the, from the outside of that conversation i love the idea of moms mothers play a, a significant role but it could be an outside consultant it could be a professor it could be having some education but that catalyst to start the conversation is essential okay uh we have also a question from uh the participants uh, we are at the third generation and we see problems coming soon. Very close family members, but with more than 100 shareholders. This is becoming critical. Any, any uh, advice? Matt, this, the floor of, is yours and, and, and then I will respond. Okay. This is a common problem as businesses get into the third and fourth generation, this diversified ownership. And there's lots of different options. And, and I'm going to go with a comment that was made already. Every family is unique. Every family solution is going to be unique. But some options that I have seen, sometimes families will consolidate ownership and they'll buy out different owners in order to, to reduce the number of shareholders. That makes decision making easier. Sometimes families will combine and create a voting trust so that a smaller group of shareholders can manage the decision making within a larger group. Sometimes it's a governance structure where we need a ownership council and that ownership council gets together and helps to understand what the shareholders want that gets passed to the board and to management. So there are a lot of different options, but to the, to the question, which is it's getting critical. Yes, something needs to be done to manage that. And there's a ton of options available. I think what the family needs to do is to sit down and look at all those different options and decide which option seems to fit best with what the family wants to accomplish. Thank you, Matt. I, I have a suggestion for uh, uh, the one who asked this. Uh, maybe at the beginning, related to governance, you should have some sort of a family assembly, okay? This family assembly might convene the family members, and then they will have some sort of a one stand that can be passed to 
the shareholders. Of course, you have shareholders, okay, from outside of the family. So you have some sort of uh, a business board or some sort of shareholders meeting where you have some sort of a solidified stand or a consolidated stand, not against necessarily, but to have some sort of a talk or an agreement with the rest of the shareholders. But eventually, to be honest, with this size, with this size, I, I agree or I would recommend to have a, a constitution or a protocol within the family. You are talking about 100. And I will give you a case study that happened with me in Egypt. I, I know that a family. They have, um, uh, by that time, it was around 70 something. They were in the fourth generation. They are one of the biggest groups working in white goods and other things, manufacturers and traders and so on and so forth. In fact, at a certain time, maybe this is not common for your part of the world, Matt, they were living at the same building. They were living at the same building. So they see each other on daily basis, okay? But now due to the, uh, the uh, due to the spread out of the family, they cannot see each other. One of the, uh, one of the things that might be uh, good for the family is to have a family retreat where they, uh, where they can meet together, maybe on the beach, whatever, and then they can have some sort of a consultant to facilitate the talk and the discussions and so on. To continue with that uh, thought, Dr. Ashraf, another question. What happens when we speak different languages? Some believe in government governance, some don't. This okay. is becoming toxic and destroying the business. There is no unicity of command. Is exiting the family business the only way out from this? Uh, very interesting. I had a case like this. We wrote about it, okay? And I will tell you in a, in a, in a minute. I'm teaching at the American University in Cairo, okay? And it's very interesting because the people there gets a top-notch uh, education. We all talk in English, okay? We have very sophisticated terminologies, but unfortunately, we go back to real life where you have to explain this to the founder. The founder might be a very simple person, but he is much more entrepreneurial than you are, okay? So you have to explain things in a very, very simple language. If you came to your father, for example, and told him, we must do governance, big word. This is a big word. Or how can I in Arabic? If the translation is how come. He will not understand you. Eventually, he might tell you, we do not need that. So please try to put it in a very simple language as a beginning. Number two, if after a while, he or she did not respond and you want to establish your own business and you came to a closed road, you might also try to convince him. In fact, I faced this situation with the business where the, uh, where the second generation or the third generation, they started, uh, they wanted to start e-commerce. They were in retail and they wanted to start the e-commerce due to COVID. And unfortunately, the uncle, the uncle, not the father, okay? He, he re resisted that direction. And the father was in some sort of a situation. He did not want to make his brother angry. And he also wanted to help his son. And we came to a closed situation. And he asked me, Dr. Ashraf, what should I do? And I told him, you might try slowly and slowly to put your endeavor within the umbrella of the family business, but step by step. It might take a year, maybe one and a half year, step by step. If you came to a closed road, he's, he's saying, I want to fulfill my dreams. You might choose to have an ownership within your family business, and it's not a disgrace, by the way, uh, keep your ownership within the family business, 
and establish your own company. Why not? Guys, we want the business to be run and to be continuous, but sometimes we also have commitment to our dreams. I hope that I've answered your question. Dr. Alan, do you have anything to add? Just quickly, I love the idea of using entrepreneurship and being open to the idea that maybe something outside the business is good. The only other comment that I would make is that when you're having communication problems, you're, you're not agreeing on language, you need to back up. Every family has some things that they do agree on, and it might be family values, it might be religious beliefs, it might be the purpose of the business overall, it might be a commitment to the community. But if you can back up until you find those common ground, you can start with that common ground and then begin to move forward again. And, and I agree with Dr. Ashraf on this. Keep it simple. A lot of times the, the language disagreements or the disagreements about things like governance aren't really because the family disagrees about governance, but it's because there's not enough understanding of what that means or it's too complex to have a conversation. And so if we simplify it, now we can talk about it in a meaningful way. Okay, another question from the floor. Is it unhealthy to bring work topics in a family business to day-to-day -day, uh, family gatherings like lunch, dinner, holiday? Matt, the floor is yours. <laughs> I, this is a great question, and, and I don't have an answer to this question because I have seen it all different ways. I know families who prohibit business conversations outside of the office. You cannot talk about it at dinner. I also know families who constantly talk about the business, and I know families who actually do their family vacations around the business. And, and each and every one of those families are successful. So what I like to say is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this question more generally. The tendency of a family business as we run into questions like this, and there are other questions that are similar. Should the next generation work outside the business before they come into the business? Another similar question. The answer depends on the family. If a family finds that discussions of the business at the dinner table are leading to a degradation of relationships in the family, then something needs to be done. But in other families, the discussion of the business is healthy. In my home, we would talk about it while we were in the car and at the dinner table, and it felt like something that unified the family. And so I would have been disappointed to push that out. But I know plenty of families where it, it alienates certain members of the family. And so having a rule that, that would push that discussion back into the office would be useful. So my answer is it depends on the family and the goals of the family. I would push towards unity and growth. And if it's not leading to unity and growth, then a change needs to be made. I want to give my answer. Uh, I don't know who, who's uh, questioning, but I will give you my, my, uh, my experience. It is inevitable. Inevitable. You will discuss business over dinner, over lunch, when you are dreaming, when you are having everything, when you are in vacation and so on. So the first thing to do is to be at ease with it. The second step, if you were able to institutionalize the business, put a system on the ground, the frequency of such discussions will be lower, but unfortunately, uh, uh, the magnitude or the impact of such discussion will be higher. You, you see the problem here? We have a big business nowadays. Everything is intact. We will discuss this only during the board day meeting or during a, the business. And we have a constitution, we have a governance system, Everything is in place, so this is very nice. So the frequency will be lower, but it depends on the degree of evolution of your business. If it is a small business where we do not have something really intact, and this happens, um, I was in a small business. So I guess that we did not have a board of directors and big things like that and governance system 
And it's not a shame, by the way. No problem. No problem. Because a lot of people ask me, Dr. Ashraf, we do not have a board of directors. I told them, this is not essential. It depends on your case. Maybe you should have a board of advisors. No problem at all. Maybe you, you should not have anything. No problem at all. But take care. Be at ease with it. With it. Try to minimize it as much as possible. But eventually, if you're, the founder is still there, to be honest, it will be very difficult unless he or she is really open-minded, is really uh, open uh, to new ideas. But eventually, he will ask you about what happened today. He wants to transfer his or her own experience as fast as possible. So you'll always talk about business. Relax and take it easy. So we're already over time, but I'm, I'm going to take this last question because it's a conflict uh, productive. So being a shareholder in the family business, but not having any added values, uh, knowledge and skills versus another family member that is not a shareholder, but is highly skilled and proficient. How to deal with this issue? Dr. Uh, Ashraf, I'll let yes, you take the lead. There is a problem here. And it happens, by the way. And I believe that this is inevitable if you do not have an employment policy. If you do not have a governance, a, this is the beauty of the governance and employment policies and agreements among the family. Unfortunately, we face this a lot in Egypt. And these people are usually looking for what we call impatient capital yeah we call it impatient they are always impatient they want money but they do not add any value you will find this everywhere so the best thing to do is to put rules and procedures we had a case study that was very interesting and it's it's published and uh, no it did not take an award it was very interesting the uncle is running the business along with his brothers. And unfortunately, his nephew is always coming to work maybe at 11.30, 12 p.m. He's at ease. He's, he's a cool person. And he started talking to his nephew. He should do one, two, and three, and four. Who was angry? The uncle, his brother, and eventually, the business was disbanded and each one of the brother, they separated everything and they got into a dispute or a conflict. They separated everything and the business was disbanded or each company went separate. The impact of, of this is that the family wealth was diluted due to some sort of a problem that happened with someone who was not responsible. So you've got to put everything into perspective, put a system, put a system. One of the things that I would recommend for employment, and I have seen this before, is to let potential successors work at other businesses, not the family business. Some of the family families that I've seen do have some sort of within that charter or the protocol or the constitution and i'm not saying that this should be done that the potential successor must work on around three years in a multinational imagine this why so that he or she can add value to the business and i always start my family business courses by saying that i am not preaching that you should all join the family business but at least you should develop a options at a certain time. Maybe you, you want to join. Maybe you do not want to join. Depends. It's a case by a case. I hope that I've answered the question. Matt? Yeah, just quickly, and I, I fully agree. This is a difficult situation. For those families that are not currently facing this situation, I think you have the opportunity to put those policies in place to avoid that situation before it happens. That is the power of having strong employment policies and creating 
clear expectations for capabilities for positions. So do that in advance, avoid the situation that the questioner is in. Now, when you're in that situation, it becomes much more difficult to deal with because I imagine you're in that situation because there is not a policy. And now you have to create a policy real time to deal with the issue. And that's difficult. My suggestion there about starting that is to, to start the conversation generally about expectations. So that the tendency is to come in and attack the individual and make it personal. And I think that's what leads to this dissolution that, that Dr. Ashraf talked about, which is to be avoided. You need to address the issue, but start generally. What are expectations for employees, for managers, for leaders in general? Let's put some, some language down for general expectations. And then let's talk generally about how would we handle situations where these expectations are not being met. And let's get some language down for how we're going to do that. You're building governance. And as you build that governance, then you can apply that governance to the individual. It's not going to be fun, but you're doing it from a general way to a specific way. I think the problems arise when you do this, what we call a knee-jerk reaction of, oh, we have a problem. Let's fix that problem. We need to address this personal in issue with this person individual. No, I would even in that situation go backwards, build some broad governance, some broad understanding that the whole family agrees to. Sometimes that process solves the problem. Sometimes that individual sees where this is going and they either change their behavior or they decide that it's not going to be a fit for them. But even if they don't, you can then take that broad governance and apply it to the individual with the support of the whole family. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ashraf and Dr. Matt. Uh, we still have questions coming, but we're way um, above the time. Uh, thank you very much for your valuable participation. It has been a really nice uh, webinar. I hope the participants really um, uh, uh, benefited from the discussion. And please, uh, before we sign off, feel free to reach out to us via email if you're interested in this topic and want to know more or if you have uh, any other questions. Uh, we'll see you next time. Goodbye, and thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for this enriching uh, talk. It was a thank pleasure. You. Thank you, Nada. Take care. Have a lovely Looking afternoon. Looking forward everyone. to seeing you. Bye-bye. Likewise, whenever Bye -bye. you are in Lebanon. Ciao. Okay. Shukran. <laughs> yeah, hello, sahla. We're going to talk Arabic, okay? Okay, shukran. <laughs> هنتكلم مصري